now um I, I i go to church now and i'm signed up to where i take an orphan home to dinner once a week or to a movie people aren't calling me miss hot tamale anymore everything's changed holly hunter from broadcast news stars as a young mississippi woman entering a local beauty contest in miss firecracker it's one of five new films we'll be reviewing this week on cisco and ebert I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is Miss Firecracker, and it's still another comedy about how everybody in the Deep South seems to be one kind of a colorful, eccentric character or another. I'm sure that Southerners are probably just generally as normal and mundane as the rest of us, but a movie like Miss Firecracker has a lot of fun with the story of a young woman who works at the catfish cannery, dyes her hair red, and enters the local beauty contest because she wants to be Miss Firecracker, and all the guys in town call her Miss Hot Tamale. Now, um, I, I'm going to be needing this outfit right away. I hope you'll be able to work quickly. Oh, sure. So. See, I've been making clothes practically all of my life. I started out when I was four years old. I used to make outfits for the bullfrogs that lived out around our yard. <laughs> bullfrogs, yeah. <laughs> they is funny-looking creatures, ain't they? Oh, Nick. I dress them up and sell them as pets. They make nice pets. That's Holly Hunter, fresh from broadcast news as the would-be beauty queen, and Alfrey Woodard as just about her only friend. Not long after, Hunter's older cousin, played by Mary Steenburgen, turns up, and she was named Miss Firecracker way back in 1972. I've left Franklin. What? <gasps> I can't believe it. And this is a sworn secret. Not a single solitary cell is to find it out. I'm, well, I won't breathe the word to anyone, I swear. See, I haven't told Franklin yet, and... He still actually believes things are bearable between us. Gosh. It turns into a regular family reunion when Steen Burgeon's no good brother barges in. He's played by Tim Robbins, the pitcher from Bull Durham. Oh, child. <laughs> look at you. What are you trying to look like a bareback rider, the Shula Traveling Carnival Show? You don't like it? Hardly, hardly, hardly. <laughs> There are you one autograph, so I guess I better get a good one. Damn it! What's the matter with you? Are you still insane? I'm not speaking to you. I'm not. What's going on? What is it? Don't ask me. Oh, no, 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 don't ask her. She would never tell. The beautiful, the sweet, the perfect Elaine Rollins refused to help her own brother get out of a dirty lunatic asylum. <gasps> And, of course, that's part of the Tennessee Williams vision of the Gothic South. Everybody is in and out of a mental asylum half the time. In a way, we've seen all of this material before. The beauty contest, the skeletons in the family closet, and the satire on small-town life. But in another way, Miss Firecracker makes it fresh again, and that's due less to the screenplay, which Beth Henley based on her stage play, which is pretty much an assembly of familiar elements. It's based more on the freshness of the performances. Holly Hunter and Alfrey Woodard are both allowed to be certifiable kooks with one weirdo line of dialogue after another, and that's fun. And Mary Steenburgen is perfect as she gives her little speech on My Life is a Beauty. I didn't care for it that much. Um, I, I agree with you that all of the stereotypes are just trotted out. That bored me. Uh, Mary Steenburgen, I thought, was absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, oddly enough, I, I thought Holly Hunter was waving in and out of character. Sometimes with her speech pattern, she seemed very contemporary. Other times she tried to be... Uh, playing the Old South character. I think if she just kept her dialogue, her, her manner of speech straight, it would have worked a lot better. Well, what you have here is a, is a uh, the firecracker contest is held in 1988, practically right. the present day, and right. yet it's obviously a holdover from uh, an by. older time, from right. small town rituals and so forth. And the, the, the notion there, I think, is that what she's trying to do is move back into that, into that. I don't she's think... trying to recapture and relive her youth and be somebody else now 
than she really is. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think she did it quite that well, because I was watching her and I was saying, no, oh, there's the woman from broadcast news. I think that character was so indelible in a way that she didn't disappear this time for me. The other thing is, I don't know what the movie is really about in a sense. I mean, in other words, I, it's just a lot of behavior, and I didn't think it added now, up Now, you that liked way. a movie called Smile several oh, years ago about a beauty film. contest. Now, I thought that this movie had some of the same touches in it in terms of the way that egos and vanity and jealousy are involved in a contest But as like you this. said, you knew it all before this started. Our next film is an embarrassment. Now, it's not Pet Cemetery, which is quite awful on its own. It's Canine, an embarrassing mix of comedy and adventure featuring James Belushi as a narcotics cop paired with a police dog in a battle to bust some drug dealers. Here's where Belushi meets his new partner. Are you sure this dog here can track down drugs? Yeah. I oh, don't know, Brandon. It looks like he's on him. Just give him a command. He'll jump to it. Ah, oh, come on. Sure. Hey, pup. Well, I think your boy might have worked better. We keep waiting for the film to become a parody like The Naked Gun, but no, the man of the dog story expands to include Belushi's girlfriend, the strange casting of Mel Harris from TV's 30-something. He's very protective. Mm -hmm. oh. Come here! Harris seems ill at ease there, and predictably, the film concludes with a monotonous chase. All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. Don't let that dog shake you out. I'm coming, shake you out. I'm coming. I just want a running start before I hit the pavement. Another chase. As I mentioned, I kept waiting for the film to become a parody of cop buddy movies. It could have been hilarious if the makers of K-9 had gone that route, you know, him talking to the dog, talking about the dog's home life and all that, all the kind of stuff we see in these cop buddy movies. Instead, it's played mostly straight with the dog whining responses to Belushi. I was embarrassed for everyone associated with this missed opportunity for really big, big laughs. Yeah, in a way, this movie could have been a real throwback in cinematic history. They once made a movie called The Sands of Iwo Jima and remade it as Rip Goes to War with Rin Tin Tin, playing right. one of the human roles. Right. That's what I thought was going to happen here. What I didn't Weren't like, you waiting for it to go that uh, direction? I was waiting for them to go right over the top with humor, and they play it I with, was... you know, heart-rending love between man and dog. And you know the part that I can't stand? I hate it when they use editing techniques to make it appear that the dog is really human. I mean, spare me any more shots where something so horrible yeah. happens that the dog has to cover up his eyes with his little paws because he just can't look, it's so bad. And the other one, when Belushi thinks the dog is dead and the dog closes its eyes and then right. Belushi is saying how much he loves him and the dog opens his eyes and then when Belushi looks back, the dog closes his eyes again. I mean, it was give awful. the dog the dignity of being a dog. Don't make him into a four-legged hairy human. Yeah, it was really quite bad. Coming up next, Kevin Bacon is a man accused of murder. Gary Oldman is the defense attorney who thinks his client might be guilty in criminal law. Don't disappoint me, Ben. This isn't about money. Our next movie is named Criminal Law, and it starts out as a spellbinder, but then it goes terribly wrong because of a fundamental stylistic error, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Hurry. The movie stars Gary Oldman as a defense attorney who successfully defends Kevin Bacon against one murder charge, and then he's asked by his client to meet him one rainy night in a park, and when Oldman gets there, he makes a terrifying discovery. Well, of course, Oldman himself was one of the prime suspects in the murder, and Detective Joe Don Baker asked him some tough questions. Uh, what about the man walking his dog? Running, running with his dog. That's all. Was the man black or white? White, I think. You think? It was dark, raining. You know, how the hell should I know? Was he tall or short? Oh, I didn't notice. Well, he probably lives around here. What's his dog look like? Come here, Russell. I don't know. Then Gary Oldman visits Kevin Bacon on his boat, and Bacon asks him to defend him one more time. This time, though, Oldman is sure his client is guilty. Sorry about last night. 
sorry. The police gave you a hard time. You could have just left. You know, you didn't have to call them. I think I did. But I didn't tell them why I was there. They'll come to me anyway. I need a good lawyer. Even innocent people need good lawyers. The price has come out. The retainer is twice what it was last time. The setup of criminal law is very effective. The opening scenes work. Gary Oldman and Kevin Bacon generate a real tension between their two characters. They have a love-hate relationship that's very intriguing here. But then a funny thing happens to this movie on its way to the end. The movie's director, Martin Campbell, and the editor, Christopher Wimble, make a crucial stylistic error. It has to do with the gimmick of the false alarm scene. Now, you know that scene. It goes to one, two, three beat. First, there's a false alarm, a scare that doesn't amount to anything. Then, beat number two, there's a moment of relief, which is kind of humorous. Then, beat number three, the big scare with a villain popping up in the foreground. Now, a false alarm scene will work once in a movie, or maybe twice, but not over and over again until it literally destroys the last third of this movie by filling it up with bad laughs. Well, it is predictable in that cutting pattern at the yes. end. I think there are other problems with the film, and I'm disappointed because some of the acting is very good, and at times, the film seems to be trying to really deal, issue, deal with the issue of uh, a, a defense attorney knowing that his client is guilty and should you give him a defense and, and all that issue. The film also swings into a whole thing about uh, abortions. Uh, it becomes very theatrical in terms of the horror elements, so it becomes like a slasher film. I, I thought that they had played it more straight and really dealt with this lawyer's uh, conflict rather than making it just a pure horror film in, in that way. Mm -hmm. th that's how the film splits apart You know the me. way it looks to me. It looks to me as if they started out with an intelligent screenplay yes. that dealt with these I issues should... and then somebody, maybe not the director, I maybe know. the producers, said we've got to jack this up with a lot of these phony scare scenes in order to sell some tickets by making it into a would-be horror film. I had the feeling that, it, that the film was recut. I don't know that it was, but I had the film that was recut to slide it toward horror. That's the way I felt. Coming up next, a film about a notorious sex scandal that brought down a government. Oh, and it's about the Profumo affair in England in the early 1960s, the great sex scandal that eventually brought down the conservative government. A party girl named Christine Keeler had been sleeping with the English War Secretary, John Profumo, and with, among others, a Russian naval attache who may have been a spy. When the news broke, Profumo denied any impropriety, but eventually he admitted his guilt and resigned. The film called Scandal focuses, however, on Stephen Ward, Dr. Stephen Ward, a social gadabout who frequents strip clubs and sees Christine Keeler as a powerful tool to influence important people. He invites her to live with him. You're out all night. I'm in the surgery all day. What could be better? Where would I sleep? You could always curl up with me. Uh, oh, don't be silly. That's not what I meant. Oh. Well, I can if you like, but it's really rather up to you. Now, we're going to be friends, Christine. Very good friends. Very good friends for a very long time. That's John Hurt in a superb performance as Dr. Ward, Joanne Wally Kilmer as Christine Keeler. Using women as playthings is a way of life for England's upper crust in this movie, as Keeler referees a swimming race between the two men in her life. Keeler finds herself upwardly mobile when she starts sleeping with Minister Profumo, played by Ian McKellen. I'm going to be all yours, Jack, whenever you want me. I wonder for how long. As long as you want me. And when I'm gone? Hmm? When I'm in Leicestershire with a room full of boring old curls, where will you be then? I'm going to buy a present for my mum. It's her birthday. Here. Buy something for me. Giving her that money will play a big role in his undoing. Scandal is a beautifully acted and photographed film, and it's about more than just the scandal. It's about the use of women, the constant visual messages in society of women as tarts, about the way scapegoats are often found. 
This is a fascinating docudrama, nicely written by Michael Thomas and directed by Michael Caton Jones. It's really one of the best films I've seen this year. I thought it was a very good film. Well acted, well directed, mm -hmm. well written, and right on the mark with its message, which was so controversial that this material could not be made as a miniseries on British television and mm -hmm. finally had to be made as this excellent movie. Because what they're saying here is that the establishment had to find a scapegoat mm -hmm. and they framed Dr. Ward as a pimp living off the earnings of a prostitute when in fact, as all the evidence indicates, not only in this movie but apparently in life, he was not a pimp at all but simply someone who believed that if he could take these young women and shape them, he could use them uh, in a way to further his own social career. Okay, well, he's not a financial pimp in that okay. sense, well, but, he's, but he, I mean, you could argue that he is one, in, he's a social pimp. Yeah, but he way. was convicted of living off the earnings of a well, that's, prostitute, that's the way the that film. he didn't yeah. do, that I he understand. didn't do. At the same time, I like the way the film spent a lot of time with shots of the women making themselves yes. up and posing and all that, mm -hmm. and of all the cues that are are in society, I mean, weren't you startled by, first of all, I was impressed that the film took the time to do that, rather than just rushing ahead with it. And story. another thing that I like was the fact that they were able to, to genuinely show the real affection that existed between Dr. Ward and Christine Keeler, two yes. people who, yes. despite the fact that they had never slept together, right. were genuinely in love with each other, and that that love survives even to the trial and despite everything else they've gone through. It's a very complex movie. I thought it was terrific. Coming up next, the Vietnam War, seen from an infantryman's point of view in a movie made by a combat veteran. It's called 84 Charlie Mopin. I am not responsible for my own actions. Uh the movie is named 84 Charlie Mopic, and it tells the story of an Army reconnaissance unit that gets lost in the central highlands of Vietnam during a mission in 1969. 84 Charlie is the name of the unit, and the word Mopic in the title describes the combat cameraman who's been sent along to make a training motion picture about the mission. The entire film is shot from the point of view of the camera that is going along on this mission, and the idea is that we observe the actual experiences of the soldiers as they happen. Look, I'm not walking in here off the street. I've had infantry training. That's stateside Mickey Mouse. Don't cut it here, sir. This is Charlie's game, his rules. We learned how to play it. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here. That's why he's here. To bring back some of that training. The leader there, named O.D., is played by Richard Brooks. And elsewhere in the film, a southerner, played by Glenn Morshauer, talks about being led into battle by a black man. You want to ask me something? Why don't you ask me if O.D. isn't the best boonie rat I ever met? Or ask me if O.D. isn't the best human being that I've ever humped a rut with? Ask me if I love him like a brother or if I'd kill for him. Because I do, and I have. The problem at moments like that is that they don't really feel like a slice of life point of view. They feel suspiciously like somebody wrote them. In the battle scenes, however, the movie is very convincing at capturing the horror and the confusion of being under fire. Before Charlie Mopick was written and directed by Patrick Duncan, a Vietnam vet who felt that few of the films about the war gave a soldier's eye view of what it was really like. He made the movie, he says, out of his own experience, and he has made a courageous and effective film. Now, actually, there was an earlier Vietnam film that also showed a single combat mission, a great 1967 documentary by Eugene Jones named A Face of War, and it would be interesting to see both of these films on a double bill because they contain all sorts of little details that only a frontline soldier would notice or remember. Like, for example, you can't smoke because the smell of an American cigarette right. is distinctive at 200 yards, and that would give you away. Um, I think that what the film does is play things in a very minimal way, and that's what I like. I agree with you that the, the real strength of the film is the simple detail of combat mm -hmm. and battles that are over in just a flash. Yes. Um, and the total randomness of being... At one, on one hand, you, they have a mission, but we're not exactly what that mission is. Mm -hmm. Sure, that mission is, except stay alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, stay alive, move forward, but uh, what are they trying to do? And that kind of confusion is communicated visually and also just emotionally over the whole period. The, I, I'll tell you one thing. I bought that it was real a couple of times. In the really? I lost myself. How about you? Uh, no, but maybe because I met the director before I saw the film, oh. so I... I knew that it was fiction. I mean, I, I did know it was fiction anyway. But I'll say this about the mission. It's the, the irony is it's a reconnaissance mission. Right. And what they're apparently supposed to do is find Not the enemy, up. which means walk around yeah. until the enemy shoots at them. Right. And the irony is, since they're lost, when they find the enemy, they won't know where they found him. 
so that well, in, they, they in, call in some they call in uh, they try uh, to call in then their radio doesn't work yeah. and then the, this happens and that happens. at the end they're just a bunch of guys walking around in the jungle wishing they were anywhere else and yeah. that's what's effective it's a terrific film now let's recap our reactions to the movies on this show a split decision on miss firecracker with holly hunter in a southern beauty contest roger liked her performance I found it uneven and the southern stereotypes all too familiar. Two thumbs down, way down for the dim-witted canine, a missed opportunity for making fun of cop buddy films. Two thumbs down for the uneven criminal law that can't seem to make up its mind between issues of criminal justice and traditional horror movie scenes. Two thumbs up, however, for Scandal, the superior dramatization of the Profumo affair with a superb performance by John Hurt as a society doctor who sets it in motion. And finally, two more thumbs up for 84 Charlie Mopic, the Vietnam combat drama told from the grunt level. And those are the two that I really like, 84 Charlie Mopic mm -hmm. and Scandal. Well, the pick of the week, I think, is Scandal. It's yes. a really good movie, and Charlie Mopic. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of five new movies, including Donald Sutherland and Lost Angels, the story of the lost children of the Los Angeles Consumer Society, and Return of Swamp Things, starring Heather Locklear, Louis Jordan, and a whole lot of moss. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Raisinets and Goobers are flying everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. After work or after workout, Daisy Turbo Spa combines powerful water massage and tingling aeration to turn your tub into a personal whirlpool. Sinutab Allergy Formula for frequent allergy sufferers. Sinutab Allergy Formula works for 12 full hours to help stop all your allergy symptoms. Tap & Sure Cook Space Saver Microwave is perfect for kitchens where space is at a premium. Tap & Touch Solid State Controls Automatic Temperature Probe and Wood Grain Decor, furnished by Tappen.